Research vessel Quest races across the Caribbean for a rendezvous. She's full steam ahead toward the Dominican Republic, where an amazing phenomenon is unfolding. Each year, on an isolated reef called Silverbank, hundreds of humpback whales gather to breed. Quest's team of divers and scientists will do what few have done, dive with the humpbacks. What they discover will astonish them. Quest's crew has been at sea for 18 days since leaving home port in San Diego, California. They're entering Dominican waters. 200 miles away lies a nursery for ocean giants. But the humpbacks are on the move, heading north earlier than expected on their annual migration. The Quest may not make it in time, a worry for adventurer and expedition leader Andrew White. The creatures are not confined by a forest or a fence or you know, geographical boundaries as we know them. They're free to roam. Adult humpbacks grow 50 feet long, weighing 40 tons. During breeding season, they can be aggressive and protective of their young. But Andrews assembled a team accustomed to danger, like underwater photographer Ron Allen. One of the memorable experiences is being snapped at by a crocodile. It snapped at the camera and uh, got a bit of a mark on my hand. <laughs> Ron enjoys a physical challenge, as does Tova Peterson. Norwegian-born, she's been diving for 20 years. Adventure, her career. I love adventure. I think that um, a bit of adrenaline boost and rush every now and then is very healthy. Dive master Lynn Micheletti grew up on boats in Australia. She's made more than 1,000 dives. I feel very fortunate to be here, and if someone had asked me what kind of job I would like, this would pretty well sum it up. Scientific advisor is Nina Young from the Center for Marine Conservation in Washington, D.C. Nina photographs humpbacks at the other end of their migration, in feeding grounds off North America. Diving with whales is usually forbidden, so Nina has never seen them underwater. But on Silverbank, she has special permission to further her studies. As a scientist, you only see them really above the surface of the water. And you see them for such a small amount of their, their lifetime, essentially. For the next two weeks, this incredible vessel will be home. Once an oil rig tender, a multi-million dollar refit transformed Quest into a launch pad for discovery. Everything the expedition needs is on board. Air compressors, a state-of-the-art edit suite, satellite communication, auxiliary craft, and a helicopter. The Quest is completely self-sufficient. She desalinates her own drinking water, 2,500 gallons a day. Her freezers store five tons of food, and an 80,000 gallon fuel tank can take her halfway around the world. To keep it all running, a ship's company of 12, drawn from the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the Philippines, under the command of Captain David Bohm. The whole team on the quest, you know, it's a big living, moving thing. Okay, so do you want us to move down that way further? Or? Yeah. In the Dominican capital, Santo Domingo, a quick stop for the last two expedition members. Whale researcher Monica Lamelas and marine biologist Jenna Sang have waited a long time for this opportunity. Until now, they've focused their studies on the Dominican coast, 
Few people venture to remote Silverbank, not even Dominican scientists. Each winter, most of the North Atlantic humpback population migrate up to 4,000 miles from their northern feeding grounds to three nurseries in Dominican waters. Samana Bay, Navidad Bank, and Silverbank, a thousand square mile patch of reef. These warm, shallow waters are crucial to the humpback's life cycle. Here they mate and give birth to their young, safe from predators like orcas and sharks, denied the cover of the deep. The reef is new territory for the Dominican scientists. Jen is concerned it may be affected by coral bleaching like many others in the Caribbean. For Monica, who supervises whale watch activities in Samana Bay, Silverbank's isolation is ideal to measure human impact on whale behavior, if the whales are still there. The whales are start arriving here in December, and they start living in April. So right now, it's, we'll be lucky if we find whales. But probably what we'll find is mother and calf, because right. usually they stay here longer. Captain Dave has another concern, how to get Quest to an anchorage in the heart of the reef. Uh, because there's not a lot of soundings in this area, I don't trust it. Although he grew up negotiating reefs in Australia, the nursery is a real challenge. Much of it is uncharted. Because there are probably uh, bombies, reef pinnacles yeah. in other areas yeah, around here. Heads, yeah. out we need to be really careful. And... Everyone's anxious to get going, including Chief Engineer John warming the twin diesel engines. But the galley crew are still out shopping. Come on, darling. On an adventure of their own. Feeding a complement of 25 for two weeks needs careful planning. Uh, you keep the count how many you put in here? No, we don't need to count. There's still a lot. Kind of. Patrick the chef does have a wish list. 100 loaves of bread, 90 pounds of fruit, 150 pounds of vegetables, half a ton of meat, and a ready supply of snacks. I don't understand. But Assistant Janine's finding the Spanish language a challenge. Liquid. Liquid? Si, liquid. Oh, okay. Least but a drink. Oh, it's a oh, oatmeal drink. I'm with you. At nightfall, with all supplies and personnel safely aboard, Captain Dave sets a course for Silverbank, hoping he's not too late. After a 30-hour steam, Quest approaches the nursery. The whales could be anywhere within its sprawling expanse. The reef gets its name from silver salvaged from early Spanish galleons wrecked on their way home to Europe. Its forest of bombies growing toward the surface test even modern captains. We don't have any soundings here apart from our own, and we haven't got much in the way of charts at all. The charts are here, but there's just, well, so far we've already found out that the, uh, all the reefs that are marked on here are already four miles out. It's going to take a, wet, a while to pick our way through the, the reef. Yeah, that's what it looks like. The charts are a little bit off. Captain Dave picks his way to the center of the reef. The Quest has GPS, radar, and sonar, but she's going to need some old-fashioned eyes. It's one of those areas where you have a lot of small bombies in a big patch of reef. You've really got to see them by eye. Sounders, echo sounders isn't any good because you're onto them before you see them starting to come up. I think you've got a uh, fairly big one just on the start of the bell there now. In fact, you're going to drive over this one so you get an idea of the depth of them, all right? Because we're going to have to go over some of these. They're deep enough. Drive slowly. Captain Dave has made a difficult decision. To measure the bombie's depth with sonar, he slowly steams over one. What else is a good idea? You just think we had any shapes on? 
just shadows and uh, not really distinct shapes. Looks about uh, maybe 15, 20 feet deep. With a draft of 13 feet, the sonar puts just three feet of water between the quest and the last bombing. Captain Dave slows the ship to a crawl. And why can't we go a bit faster? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, treacherous waters, Take bombings time. everywhere. And I guess if we um, ground the ship, we won't be going anywhere. Yeah, we'll ruin the whole trip. <laughs> It's a frustrating time as First Officer Pete Roman plots their progress. We haven't come very far from the last plot. It's very slow going through these bombings. Just a big zigzag. Adding to the disappointment, the team has not seen a single whale. Then nature produces the perfect tonic. Humpbacks are among the most acrobatic of whale species, with an incredible array of surface displays. Yep, right. Could that be females or males? Both of them do it. It's, it's kind of like communication, um, establishing territory. Nina's seen these antics in feeding grounds off the U.S. coast of Maine, where humpbacks gorge themselves, storing enough energy for their long journey south. If the team can get close enough to identify them, Nina may find some old friends. Oh, yes! But the Quest must first find a safe anchorage. SkyQuest pilot James Daly lends a hand. James has been behind joysticks for 30 years. He was trained in the Australian military and has made a career of flying difficult missions in colorful shirts. Well, this will be fun. He may look like he's on a Caribbean holiday, but he has one of the toughest jobs on the team. Operating from a deck this size leaves no room for mistakes. Yeah, well, it is interesting that when it is choppy and it's bouncing around, it can, uh, it can be fun. Well said, I'm ready to go. But Monica is in good hands. James and the Quest have a perfect safety record. He's just telling me Dave. Roger, Roger, copy that. Back there, okay? No problem. Yeah. Good one. Thank you. Andrew and James hope to guide the quest through the bombies to an anchor site. Monica is hoping to find some whales. Ooh, I can see why he got into trouble here. Yes, he uh, was going the wrong way, all right. <laughs> the Polyzanes came to grief here 18 years ago. She was en route to load sugar when she ran aground. And it really spoiled his day. Uh, James, you copy? Back to you, big fella. You told Dave uh, up where the uh, wreck is. It looks like you can get in pretty close. Uh, there's a lot of bombies very, very close in, right on the edge of the uh, reef. You can probably get within at least half a mile of the, uh, of the wreck. Thank you, mate. I'll let you know. Thank you. Captain Dave can make the last few miles with confidence. It is a day of first for Monica. She's never been to Silverbank, she's never been in a helicopter, and she's never seen a whale from the air. Oh, it's so beautiful. Here's looking at me. Whoa. Here you go. Coming up to breathe. Yeah, beautiful. Humpbacks are common to the world's major oceans. Hunting in the Atlantic and Pacific almost destroyed them. But since protection in the mid-1960s, the numbers are coming back. I don't know it's my imagination, but they seem to have, their, their fins seem to be whiter. The Pacific side, they have a, they're like black on top. Here, their, their pectoral fins are white on both sides. It's the arched back, or hump, exposed during a dive that gives the whale its name. In open ocean, humpbacks can dive to more than 1,000 feet. Is that a uh, baby one? Yeah, that's quite small. Wow, can you see the huge difference in size? Yeah, the, the, it's quite tiny, really. Yeah. 
Although small compared to its mother, calves are born 14 feet long, weighing more than two family cars. They pull away a bit now. They're saying, oh, no, don't fall out, whatever you do. Actually, I like it like that. All right. <laughs> oh, look at the, the baby right in front. For the first 12 months, mother and calf are inseparable and often accompanied by a male. But this family picture is not what it seems. The protective escort is probably not the father, but another male waiting his turn to mate. Such relationships and the warm Dominican waters are vital to the survival of the North Atlantic species. We do not know for sure why, especially Silverbank, we do know that the calf when they're born, they have only one inch of insulating fat. So they do need to be born in warm, protected waters. And this is uh, the ideal climate for them. OK, Mick, you can let it go. Three shackles. Safely at anchor, the Quest can launch a flotilla of support craft, two inflatables, and the 38-foot cruiser, Quest 2. The teams relieve the whales are still here, but how long they'll stay is uncertain. Andrew and Monica are anxious to get out on the water. So is Tova, who'll make the first attempt to shoot the whales from underwater. She'll join Andrew and Monica in an inflatable. Because whales can be disturbed by scuba bubbles, the tactic is to approach them using snorkel. No one knows if the plan will work. Nina's staying dry this afternoon. Aboard Quest 2, she and a video crew hope to record the whale's patterned tails, or flukes, for identification. Each one is different, like a giant fingerprint. Both teams expect to be looking for hours, but within minutes of setting out. Oh yeah, 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 saw it, saw it. it it's like a 12 o'clock directly ahead of us. Yeah, there's one, two. It's not just mothers and calves enjoying the hospitality of Silverbank. The team has spotted a group of males fighting for a mate. I'm trying to take a dive time, but these whales are moving pretty fast, and there's a lot of activity going on underwater. It looks like one was ramming the other one. You can see the side of the tail. Then, as quickly as they appeared, the group vanishes. Please, please, please. <laughs> please, please, please. They go down, and then... You think they're going that way, yeah. and then they turn back and go yeah. the other way. And I lose track of that tree. A few minutes later, the group resurfaces near Quest 2. Chin breach, somewhere up, she's up. With a roll, flippers in the air. Ha -ha! Nina and her crew can hardly believe their luck. They're witnessing a brawl as six males fight over one female. So as they follow her, you're going to have ones that are going to try to get on either side to get in there in order to, to copulate with her. Like many marriages in the animal kingdom, aggressive competition ensures that only the strongest males pass on their genes. She's turning. Turning, they're heading in the other direction, away from us. The scrimmage continues in a wild zigzag across Silverbank. Oh, oh, no. Two, three, four, five, One, six three. whales. And they're rounding each other, Toba. They're just thinking of what they're doing. I mean, they don't care about people, boats, or anything, you know. So they just got to be very careful. This isn't the quiet approach Toba had planned. I'm ready. <laughs> they're coming our way. Come on. They're coming directly at us. Toba's very fit but she'll be struggling to keep up with this pod. Be careful, Toba. They're ramming each other. They're just thinking of the female. Go, Toba. Go, 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 go. 
Underwater, their speed seems effortless. Throughout their chase, the pod seems oblivious to the quest craft. This is great! Driven by instinct, they have only one concern right now. Whoa, look! When it was on its back, somebody almost got her. As whales come in and get into the alpha spot and have access to her, that one will have access and then he'll leave and the other ones will then compete. So it's very difficult to actually know which animal is the father because she'll copulate several times in a season. Ready to go again? Yep. The divers have another shot. Tova and Andrew rethink their strategy. To have any chance of recording this active group, they'll need to stay submerged. They opt for small scuba tanks hoping the distracted males will ignore their scuba bubbles. The pod appears, playing out a strange ballet. Underwater, the humpback's huge pectoral fins, the largest of any whale, appear like wings. Reaching out 15 feet, they have a similar bone structure to a human hand. But it's the mighty humpback tail that propels them up to 10 miles per hour too fast for mere humans. Whoa! Did you see that? Look! This huge chest type is crazy. Is there all the files chasing us either? Yeah. Was that fantastic? We get back oh, in, we can do another one. Okay, so that's a service acting group. Did you get it on film? Georgie! Oh, that's great. That was fantastic. That was really good. Oh, wow. amazing before when they were sort of upwind of us and they were exhaling and we were getting covered in their uh, exhaust. You could smell their breath even. It's so close to them. Whales have bad breath. It's about the only bad thing you can say about them. Today was just the beginning, just a taste of what is out there. And it's really fabulous to see right here on Silver Bank nature alive, and these animals that were almost extinct coming back and regaining their numbers. Next morning, there's a buzz on the decks. Everyone's anxious to get out on the water. The dive photographers will spend the day trying for another encounter. Jenna, with Lynn's help, wants to examine the reef he's never seen to gauge its health. Although this humpback nursery is classified a marine park by Dominican law, Commercial fishing is still allowed, and Jenna wants to know how fish populations are affected.
With courting whales still in the area, Monica and Nina have their own plans to eavesdrop on the ritual with an underwater microphone. Apart from humans, whales are the only animal species to sing. Birds and other creatures repeat program phrases, but only the whale writes songs. Okay, we're in a pretty good spot, I reckon, so uh, if they're down there, I reckon we'll hear them. Great. Whale songs are produced only by males, leading researchers to believe they're most likely mating calls to attract a female and perhaps to notify rivals. If you're a male, you want to hang down there and sing as long as you can because that shows that you're really fit. It attracts the female that way, so you want to be down there singing your lungs out because that is supposedly one of the ways that the males will attract the female. If the team can capture a song, Monica will send the recording to an acoustics laboratory in Singapore as part of a long-term project to decipher the whale language. Meanwhile, Jenna and Lynn explore the reef. It doesn't look good. Some Caribbean reefs have succumbed to coral bleaching, where changing water temperature, increased sunlight or pollution stresses the coral polyps. But Silverbank looks different. It seems overgrown with marine algae. Perhaps the result of overfishing. I found a large part of the reef has uh, large quantities of dead coral. Commercial species are lacking, or very few specimens, most likely due to overfishing. Herbivorous fish and sea urchins usually keep marine algae in check. When this balance is lost, coral polyps, the builders of the reef, can be overrun. Back on Quest 2, some good news. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, right. oh, wow. Humpbacks don't have vocal cords. Males sing by floating head down and manipulating muscles in their respiratory system in their trachea and nasal passage, leading to their blowhole. Each breeding season starts with a common theme, which can be heard underwater for up to 100 miles. But then a remarkable thing happens. The song starts to change and the variation spreads through the breeding ground. By the end of the season, everyone is singing the new theme. And it's that whale that is the most dominant that they believe changes the song over the course of the, the summer. Everybody just kind of copies him. But the most spectacular whale behavior is not restricted to males. Oh, wow. The dive team encounters what appears to be a breaching lesson between the mother and calf. Oh, that'd be so nice. Why whales breach remains a mystery. It could be another means of communication. There's also evidence the water friction removes parasites, like barnacles and sea lice, from their skin. Whatever the reason, all humpbacks learn it from an early age. I just want to get over there. The acrobatic pair quickly disappears, leaving a frustrated dive team. Little do they know their colleague is about to make first contact. Just as Lynn and Jenna are finishing their coral survey, a mother and calf approach their boat. This is unbelievable, man. I cannot believe how close they are to the boat. Lynn grabs a snorkel and camera. The mother swims right up to her. The two mammals float face to face, each as curious as the other. It's a 
pretty awesome feeling to know that something else that big is actually genuinely interested in you. There's not even really any touching, but it's really beautiful. The pair stays for two minutes. Then with no sign of aggression, the mother slowly rolls away, disappearing with her calf into the Caribbean blue. my distance but they really approached me. Oh, I'm so jealous. Back in Quest's edit suite, everyone's anxious to view Lynn's footage, especially Nina. She's never seen a humpback this close. Oh, that is the oh she's rolling. Oh my gosh, look at that. All oh the throat God. grooves. You can see the eye. Yeah. <laughs> How close were you when you did that? Just, they just kind of stopped right in front of me at this stage. And I was just watching them and just filming and look at that. You can see friends. her whole stomach and the flippers. Oh my god. Oh, uh, this is fabulous. You've done exceptionally <laughs> well. You've done very, very well. But Andrew, can you just back up a little bit? Can you just go back a little bit more? Yeah, there, 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 right there. Just come through here. Yeah, see all the bumps? The whalers used to call them stove bolts because they thought that's what held the whale, whale's head together. <laughs> what? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> stove, bolts. Mean, stove bolts. And there's a single hair that sticks up out of each one yes. of these. It's a single hair and it allows them to sense pressure. So when we're underneath mm -hmm. the water, pressure difference, it's getting a little bit of restriction because there's a body there and that's another reason why it says up oh, and she away must yeah. turn. Next day the quest luck holds out. Several mother calf pairs are still in the area and just as curious. Lynn's close encounter has surprised Nina. She expected the mothers to be more protective of their calves. The experience gives the team a new confidence. They will try to make their next contact, not from the surface, but from below. It's like a dream of a lifetime. Andrew and Ron will use rebreather tanks, which recycle exhaled air, reducing bubbles. Rebreathers are more cumbersome to use, but should allow the divers to stay below without disturbing the whales. The Dominican scientists will spend the day collecting data aboard Quest 2. Yeah, please tell me the wind direction. We've got a light north northeast of this, uh, this morning, about three, four knots, about light airs. Okay, thank you very much. Just out there on the starboard beam, about 150 yards. Yeah, right out there, coming around there. Okay, here they came up, 4 minutes and 29 seconds. By recording yeah. whales' dive times, Monica and Jenna can gauge the animal's tolerance to boats. This is the key to managing such a crucial humpback nursery. We are taking dive times, uh, analyzing their behavior. We hope to find if there's any impact on the population and if because we're in certain area they decide to change their habitat or if, if it doesn't matter at all. Back on the dive boat, there's quiet excitement. Nearby, a mother calf pair float on the surface, a behavior known as logging. This is what they've been waiting for.
Without a rebreather, Nina will hang back. Approaching from below, Andrew and Ron aren't quite prepared for what they see. We made a direct approach to this mother and calf, and they were both sound asleep. As I approached, the mother just opened her eye up very slowly and took a look at me, shut her eye again, completely aware that we were there, safe in the knowledge that we weren't going to hurt her. She said, I'm going back to sleep. This mother needs her rest. She hasn't eaten since leaving her feeding grounds three months ago, and she's yet to make the round trip. The only whales feeding at Silver Bank are the calves, suckling more than 100 gallons of milk a day. It's an incredible drain on a mother's energy supply. She'll lose one third her body weight by the time she returns north for her next meal. Life is more carefree for the calf. The team watch as it maneuvers around its mother. At one point, blowing bubbles under her chin. This tactile bond was an education for Nina. You can see somewhat of their bond above water, but underwater it's so much stronger. I've never been able to see that before. Nina can also see from genital slits above the calf's tail, she's a female. Her time in the Silverbank nursery is critical. During her two month stay, she'll grow quickly, gaining 200 pounds a day, building a thick layer of fat to survive the long journey north in the cold waters of the North Atlantic. Although the pair seems undisturbed by the divers, the team withdraws, leaving the sleeping mother to rest. There's little rest aboard the small village floating alone on Silverbank. Three times a day, Quest Galley becomes a self-serve restaurant, fueling 25 people whose appetites are amplified by the constant activity and sea air. Tonight, the scientists have skipped dinner. Nina is desperate to identify the mother. Where did she come from? Had Nina photographed her before from the surface? Computer catalogs containing thousands of collected images help researchers identify known individuals and add new ones. Most editions come from North America, but Monica's encouraging Dominican observers to make their contribution. In the central part of the tail fluke. So let's mark that and search. It looks mm. like it, but she doesn't have those black edges like that. Yeah, and then the right. black in the center isn't fat enough. The sleepy mother could have come from any of five different regions in the North Atlantic. They're coming from Iceland, Greenland, Newfoundland, Labrador, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and the Gulf of Maine in the east coast of the United States. Well, we're not having a whole lot of luck here, but that's not unusual. I mean, we're all very attached to her because we've got such great footage of her. But for the most part, it's, it's really difficult and in fact, they estimate the humpback whale population now at about 10,000 animals. And in the catalog, we have 3,000. So we're missing a good portion of the population in the catalog. So it is a necessity to start photographing here as well. Absolutely, because you are really right in the central portion of where all of these whales come together. Nina still holds out hope. She'll email the image by satellite phone to the College of the Atlantic in Maine their larger database may hold a match. An uneasy calm has descended on Silverbank. After a week of excitement, Quest luck seems to have run out.
For days, everyone's been out looking, even the galley crew. But the whales seem to have gone. The last of the mothers and calves may have left on their long journey north, and with them, the chance to record more parenting behavior. But then, a mother and calf make a spectacular entrance. The mother is lobtailing, a behavior rarely seen from underwater. Tova and Ron attempt to catch it. As they reach the pair, the mother stops, but the calf seems ready for its turn. While Ron stays below, Tova braves the thrashing tail on the surface. Watching aboard the quest, Monica has her heart in her mouth. After some preliminary flipper slapping, the calf prepares for a lobtail. It suspends itself upside down using pectoral fins for balance. Researchers can only speculate on the purpose of these acrobatics. Perhaps it's a fishing technique used in the feeding grounds. A percussive language. Or just humpback play. It took oh some doing, God. but they got the shots. <laughs> oh, I'm exhausted. Absolutely exhausted. On another boat, Nina had all but given up hope for a close encounter. Until... Whoa, wait, no! <laughs> Nina will have her chance after all. Andrew wastes no time. This could be his last chance to shoot. With only one rebreather tank on board, Nina and Lynn will approach on snorkel. circle around, apparently willing to stay with the divers. Nina recognizes the tail fluke of the sleepy mother she met days earlier. This time, she is in for a formal introduction. Never imagined when I got into marine biology that I would be face to face, eye to eye, with a humpback whale. So you're, you're trying to drink in this entire animal because from a biological sense, you rarely see them next to you. Andrew feels it's safe to move closer. Looking through his viewfinder, he starts to focus on the mother. Then the calf catches his attention. I felt a tap. I look around, and my heart nearly leapt out of my mouth. The, the baby whale had come up, outstretched pectoral fin, playing with me. She then moves to Nina, 
who's mesmerized by the agility and skill of such a young calf. Just a complete revelation. Seeing the calf explore its environment, its relationship to us, understanding spatially where it is in the ocean compared to its mother, compared to the divers, was incredible. This magical day holds one more surprise for the expedition. Waiting on Nina's email is a very important message. Andrew, get in here. We've got a match. The yeah. College of the Atlantic has found a match. Look, it's a whale by the name of Liberty. Liberty. Found in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. First photographed in 1985, and they continue to see. Oh, that's fantastic. Fantastic. This, this is the mother fantastic. and calf that we've been swimming with. Oh, that's terrific. Liberty. Somehow, the gentle mother who shared her calf with the divers is no longer a stranger. It is Liberty, now heading home to Canada to raise her calf. Safely back at the Dominican mainland, the extraordinary adventure is over. Everybody say cheese. Cheese! The team has gathered invaluable scientific data and experience. For Nina, the rare humpback footage reveals a curiosity, intelligence, and awareness beyond anything she could imagine. Jenna has a warning from the reef and will alert his government to the danger. And Monica's surface observations will help her refine whale watch regulations in Dominican waters. Everybody has joined in the quest of learning more about humpback whales. Everybody on board has been touched by the experience of an encounter with humpback whales. And I think their lives are going to be changed just from this trip. I really respect the, the crew and what they've done here. And the footage that we have, I think we'll, we'll be able to share with lots of people so they get a sense of how magnificent these creatures are and how they've really touched the lives of all the crew. Although the quest must leave for her next mission, the memory of this encounter will last forever. They've made a connection with another species, a species living in a different world, but on the same planet. If you were to be an explorer and to go into outer space and encounter some alien life form, if you came back and told stories of that, people would be amazed. The alien life forms that we should be looking for and communicating with are actually here on Earth. <laughs>